Hello and welcome everybody to today's Craftsy Chats. Uh, my name is Leah. I will be keeping an eye on all of your questions throughout today's entire event. And speaking of those questions, I want to draw your attention to the chat box. So that will be either below the video or the comment box on Facebook or YouTube. Throughout today's entire event, if you have questions about anything from today's guests, you can drop those into the box and we'll get to as many as we can with the time that we have. If you want to practice right now and just say a little quick hello and where it is that you're you're viewing from. We do love to know just where everybody is around the world during these fun live events. So that's all I have for you, which means it is already time to bring on today's instructor. Her name is Robin Miller, and I'm going to let her give us a brief introduction about herself, where you may have found her before today, and uh, get us rolling on some questions after that intro. Hi and welcome, Robin. Thank you, Leah, and thank you everyone for joining. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I was really looking forward to this today. So uh, I'm Robin Miller. I am a food writer, cookbook author, instructor at Craftsy, host of Quick Fix Meals, also which is on Discovery. I am currently writing my 11th cookbook. I have a, a daily blog. I write for USA Today Food and um, a lot of newspapers nationwide. Um, so that's in a nutshell. I'm a mom of two teenagers. And um, I'm here today to share what knowledge I have. We can go back and forth and, and swap stories. If you have questions about recipes, nutrition, um, what my shows are like on Craftsy, I have two with a co-host. Um, just pick my brain. That's why I'm here. And I'm excited to um, just open up and, and, uh, and be here for you. Well, let's start with a really general question. I'm sure we'll get a little more detailed as we keep on going in. But one of our first questions came in from Sandy. Uh, do you talk about Instant Pots? Uh, what are your thoughts on those in general? Yes. Hi, Sandy. Um, thank you so much. So yes, in fact, uh, the show that I have on Craftsy Efficient Weeknight Cooking, my co-host Katie Workman and I each share a recipe for using the Instant Pot, which we call a multi-purpose cooker, uh, which is really what it is. So I do a braised pork loin in that, and she does this really amazing baked ziti with the insert. So it comes out and it's like a baked ziti and it's phenomenal. My mouth is watering just thinking about it. But yes, we definitely do that. And I know that a lot of my recipes in my daily blog, in my cookbooks um, and on Craftsy are adaptable to the Instant Pot and to the multi-use cooker. So um, in general, yeah, there's, there's plenty of ways. And I find that most people that have those have learned how to adapt a recipe that doesn't call for the multi-function uh, to be able to adapt it. So you sear, turn it on, put the lid on, walk away and come back. So um, there are many ways to, to get to be able to use that appliance that's on your counter. Yes, and to follow on to that, size-wise, I know there's a variety. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you recommend for somebody that might be looking to get their first Instant Pot? I think it depends on the size of your household. So for me, now I have one off in college and I have a teenager at home. I would get a small to medium size. My mom would get the smallest. If you're cooking big batch cooking, if you have a big family or on Saturdays and Sundays, you like to make a big batch of something to serve and then freeze for a future meal, which was one of my favorite things to do, I would suggest going with one of the bigger um, options. And also, where do you live? So, you know, I, I wrote my first cookbook in a little tiny New York City apartment where I used my coffee table as my cutting board. So um, there again, you would use the one that serves two or, or four with leftovers. Um, so it's about your countertop and when will you get the, you know, how will you use it most efficiently? If you're really just making rice in it, then obviously uh, you would want to go with the smaller one. Uh, I had my own small New York City apartment. I'm very familiar with the coffee table cutting board. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, this one comes in from Martha. Martha is interested in finding a sugar-free poppy seed dressing. Interesting. Hi, Martha. Um, you know, it's funny. I think that I don't even think of sugar right away when I think of dressing. However, um, there's a lot, usually a lot of lemon or yogurt or something in the poppy seed dressing. So, um, if you are opposed to honey, so maybe you don't want that kind of a sweetener. Uh, I, I love honey and I love agave. I also think they work great in emulsifying with it. I was like about to shake a bottle or a jar. So I always put honey or agave in my homemade salad dressings along with the Dijon mustard. And then in this case, it would be poppy seeds and lemon. Um, that said, there are some really wonderful sweeteners now 
made with monk fruit. So um, there, you know, back in the day, there was this, this stevia, well, not even like stevia is um, relatively new, but there were the artificial sweeteners that made us a little, you know, we were a little nervous about those. So monk fruit based sweeteners. Now I'm starting to cook with those and I love them. They bake, you can bake with them. You can make salad dressings with them. So um, I know in the raw makes one and Splenda makes one. So if you want to reach research that and stay away from even honey agave, that's something you could try. I think that would, that would work great. All right. While we're talking about sugar-free, Carolyn is looking for a sugar-free chocolate cake recipe. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, um, so the sugar-free, um, these monk fruit base. So I know uh, in the raw has a baking one. Splenda has a baking one because I've baked with them. So I know that they work and they work like one for one. The ratio is one to one with sugar. So it calls for a cup of sugar. You use a, a cup of this monk fruit based sweetener, low glycemic index. Um, and so they work great. I have made brownies, I've made cakes, I've made um, cookies. So they've definitely come a long way because back in the day you couldn't do that. So, and I like knowing that it's a plant, you know, that I'm, I'm actually getting my sweetness from an actual fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes me feel a little bit better about what I'm eating and what I'm serving. Perfect. All right. We're going to move away from sugar-free for the moment. But if you have more questions about sugar-free things, keep them coming. Uh, we're going to go to Laura's question next. Uh, Laura is asking, what would be the best eating plan for heart health? Oh, okay. Laura, that's a good one. Um, and the funny thing is when I get questions about heart health and even diabetic-based, di diabetic-focused diets, I think this is the way we all should be eating anyway. So everyone, whether you have a heart condition or preventing one or you're diabetic, everybody should be eating pretty much the same way, which is a healthy, balanced diet of crammed with nutrients. So lots of plants and, and you're going to, you're going to have the paleo and you're going to have the keto um, people out there that are going to say all meat all the time. But the what science has shown, and I've been doing this for 30 years, that the healthiest diets and the and the populations that live the longest have plant-based diets. So lots of fruits, vegetables, legumes, you know, beans, lentils, nuts, seeds. So that makes up the bulk of the diet. So not only are these heart protective because they have phytonutrients from the plants. So the colorful, you know, orange, red, and green in your fruits and vegetables is heart protective. There are phytonutrients, which are antioxidants, which help protect uh, oxidation. Um, but there's fiber. And we know that soluble fiber takes the bad cholesterol and just sweeps it right out of your body. So there's many, many, many different ways. And I can go on and on and on and on and write a book about it of all the ways that plants protect your heart. And then um, you can, if you don't want to only exist on plants, which obviously you need uh, protein in the form of lean meats, fish and shellfish, oily fish, high in omega-3s, great for your heart. Same with uh, nuts, which are over there in the plant family. Um, so lean chicken, lean steak, um, fish and shellfish. Uh, I love eggs. I know that they got a bad rap for many years because people thought the cholesterol was bad. Now we find out that Cholesterol in food doesn't translate to cholesterol in your body. So um, a lean diet, healthy oils, lots of plants. That, that to me is the most heart protective diet and walking every day too. So we can't get to the gym. The weather's not great. Just try to just always be moving. Yes, indeed. I'm a big fan of the moving myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to RJ's question next. Uh, RJ is something. asking... What is the most nutritious way to thicken a pie that's made with fresh fruit? Most nutritious way to thicken mm -hmm. a pie? Well, there's really two ways to thicken a pie. And one is flour and one is cornstarch. So um, you really only need a tablespoon of either one. So I wouldn't say one is healthier or less healthy than the other. The, usually what you do with things like peaches and apples and things that are going to soften and create um, a lot of water in the pie during baking is you toss them with either flour or cornstarch. My favorite is cornstarch. Um, I think it makes a satiny filling and not a um, tinted one, you know, it's like not, a, not a murky one. I love that cornstarch thickens and, and remains clear. So that tends to be... Um, 
My choice, I know some folks use arrowroot instead of cornstarch. That's another option. So you would toss the fruit before it's just coating evenly, no clumps, uh, before it goes into the pie crust um, and bake that way. And that way, as it creates the moisture, it also thickens and creates a wonderful filling at the same time. So I hope that answered the question. All right. Good luck, RJ. Hopefully that will help. RJ. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's move to Patricia's question next. Uh, Patricia's having some difficulty in getting pork chops to come out tender and uh -huh. is wondering, has there been a change in growing pork? Because years ago, it was not a problem for me. Should I be cooking them in the oven instead of frying them? Do you have any other additional suggestions? Interesting. I like this question. I don't think pork production has changed at all. I do think so. There's so many different things came to mind. So um, cause I recently cooked, uh, pork chops and I, they were thinner. I wanted to get thick cut. So the, the best way to guarantee a tender pork chop is to get the thick cut. And if you can't find a thick cut, ask for one, go to your butcher. They would love to do it. You could even say restaurant cut really thick, quick pan sear. I keep the pork out of the oven for the most part to prevent that, to prevent it from getting tough and drying out. Um, that dry heat can really do a number on pork very quickly. So a quick pan sear and then always have a meat thermometer right there next to the pork. Stop at 135. Um, some recipes will tell you to stop sooner because the temperature continues to rise after you take the pan off the heat. Then it could be your pans. Do you have new pans that, um, you know, cast iron are you using now that might get hotter faster? Um, those are the kind like all those elements could come into play. Um, but definitely the thicker cut, um, quick cooking, um, and using a meat thermometer will guarantee. And I, I, you know, when in doubt, I always go to like the pork producers, uh, what is it? Uh, the pork producers counts, whatever their website is, um, for recipe inspiration and for all the temperature chart for all the different cuts of pork. Um, and that's, that's a big help because you'll know then safety, food safety wise and Stopping early is usually the key to tender pork, but you don't want to stop too early. Okay, let's uh, move into some Tex-Mex for our next question. Okay. So Tina is in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Hi, Tina. Uh, Hi, I was raised on Tex-Mex and Southern cooking, and the doctor has put me on a plant-based whole food diet. Do you have any suggestions for tailoring some of that Tex-Mex love to a plant-based diet? I Well, Tex-Mex is plant-based if you think about it. So I'm not sure what you're referring to with Tex-Mex, but to me, that's beans and rice and tomatoes and green chilies and cilantro and green onions and chili and cumin. I mean, I don't, am I missing? I don't know why. So to me, if I'm going to make a big plant, a big Tex-Mex meal, that's what I'm going to be thinking about. Lots of different beans, um, maybe your favorite grain of choice. If rice isn't your favorite grain, farro, spelt, something like that. Um, keeping the salt down is probably a big thing. So when you add lots of fresh herbs, cilantro um, and green onions, I adore. Parsley is naturally high in sodium. You can cut back on salt. Um, smoky, um, warm spices like chili powder and cumin. Um, they add tremendous flavor without fat, without salt. Um, you And then if you wanted to add a little protein to that, you could do tofu, which is plant-based, or you could do lean chicken, or you could throw in some shrimp, some lean steak. So you could have just a bounty of, of you know, with your base of rice and beans and just build from that. And that's a, a wholesome meal. I think keeping out the lard and keeping out the butter and using, you know, a reasonable amount of a healthy fat like olive oil, um, that, that'd be great. And you wouldn't really feel like you're missing anything. All right, and if you're out there, Tina, and you wanted any more specifics, go ahead and drop some follow-ups in the comment box. I'll make yes. sure to get those asked to Robin. Yes. As well. And also make sure you check my blog because I do. I love. I live in in Arizona, so I love cooking um, flavors of the Southwest, so, especially because I was born and raised in the Northeast. So I think that's why it's you know it's really fun for me to play around with those flavors. Ooh, we have a suggestion to circle a little bit back to when we were talking about pie filling. Uh, one yes. of our viewers, Kathleen, mentions that uh, they've used tapioca to firm up pie fruit. What do you think about that? I think that's a good idea. Tapioca, that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. It takes a village, a craftsy chat. It really does. The community <laughs> uh, is really great in the comments here. And also what I was thinking about um, after 
still thinking about the pie because I'll be thinking about these questions all day long. <laughs> So I was thinking about the pie. And one of the things that I found um, is that depending on whatever the fruit is, sometimes apples I find do best when you give them a quick saute instead of putting them into the pie raw. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes things like harder, firmer fruits like peaches and peaches if they're firm and apples do best with a quick saute, maybe a tablespoon of butter, get them a little bit of a head start before going in. That tends to, um, they, they tend to absorb whatever thickener you're using and cook to the perfect tenderness without overcooking the pie crust. Perfect. All right, I'm sure we'll be back at pie before we know. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a great one as we're in the month of August. This comes in from Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca asks, what do you suggest for a summer party meal that's not so heavy on meat? Brats and burgers are so easy, but this far into summer, we're a little sick of them. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, they are good. And even though you, if you could even could have just the brats, but then load up everything else. So this time of year, I'm huge into corn, things you could do with corn, things you can do with tomatoes, things you can do with blueberries, because we're going to run out of them soon and we'll be sad. So um, I know the traditional corn on the cob is a, is, you know, something that's kind of on the side, but I have turned that into a main dish many, many, many times. In fact, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I just took a sheet pan I soaked corns on the cob, corn on the cob in the husk because I think that that's a tedious task. So I try to make it easier. So I soaked them first and then lined about 12 ears on a baking sheet and roasted it at 400 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes until the husk was starting to get a little bit charred. Then I took the sheet pan out, wrapped it in foil. The husk came off immediately. The corn went into a bowl and I added bell peppers, white beans, lots and lots and lots of fresh, fresh herbs. And that was like the centerpiece. Everyone loved it because it was fresh corn, my mouth's watering, super sweet, fresh corn that barely needs any cooking. It was easy to make. And you can throw in whatever produce you have in your produce drawer, if you, whatever vegetables you want to add, beans from your pantry, a can of fire roasted tomatoes would beef that up. Um, so that's great. I know that um, pasta salads tend to be kind of a big hit, easy to make ahead. Um, and, but something fun might be to do, and I did this recently, a pearled couscous salad. So it's just a little bit different, easier to eat with a spoon, great for a crowd. You cook the pearled couscous, just, you know, you follow the box instructions, it cooks in five minutes, and then load it up with vegetables and herbs. It's hearty, it's satisfying, it's, it's really pretty, and it travels well. Um, so we've got like a corn, we've got, if I, and then any kind of salsa, that you can make. So mango and tomato, avocado, those are fantastic additions to any kind of a summer spread. So I hope that helps. I can add, I can always come up with more, but um, whatever you can find that's fresh and local, and if you can't find it local, just get it ripe. Um, that's really what we should dive into now, because soon we're going to be talking about butternut squash for three months. <laughs> so Now, as a follow-on to that, what about portobello mushrooms. Oh my gosh. Love. Grilled, anything that you have thoughts for that? Yes, 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 yes. I love grilled portobello mushrooms. Sometimes I just literally brush them with olive oil, salt and pepper and grill them. And then when they come out, just a drizzle of balsamic glaze, you don't really need anything else. Um, that could be a burger. That could be your bun. And then you could have sliced tomatoes inside, maybe sliced tomatoes and some fresh mozzarella and have portobello as your bun. Um, but definitely a platter of portobellos and you could do fresh lump crab meat. That's a summer August thing. Um, other vegetables piled on top At, for sliced portobellos. Those are super easy to eat and make a great appetizer too. So you do the process of grilling them, slice them into, you know, strips and serve some wooden picks on the side. And that, that's a great hearty, feels like you're eating steak, um, dish that people love. Now, what are your thoughts on caprese salads? Jenna is saying in yes. the comments, it's one of her favorites during this time. Caprese style, the mushrooms or just caprese? It looks like just caprese salads, but caprese anything. Nice yeah, caprese anything all day long. That's my motto. I, I love it. So I have done caprese chicken. So I take chicken, pan sear it, then cup fresh mozzarella, tomato, balsamic, and basil and called it caprese chicken. I've done caprese portobello mushrooms. I've done caprese steak. But yes, the traditional salad, um, and I make it probably once a week. I get just a, a, a beautiful, um, I've actually done it with burrata too. I put the burrata in the middle and put um, sliced tomatoes around the outside, drizzle balsamic vinegar, splash of basil, and then you cut into the burrata 
in front of everyone and it oozes out and it's just fantastic. But I've also done it with a um, fresh mozzarella and I do like a pinwheel of the mozzarella and then I insert the tomato slices all the way around. So it's just a super pretty presentation and the drizzle, it's a, it just, it looks like a pinwheel. It's really, really pretty and, and everyone, everyone loves that. It is a delicious, very yes. refreshing snack. And healthy. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's get into an equipment question next. Uh, this is from Patricia. Uh, Patricia wants to know if you have a favorite instant thermometer to keep handy near the stove. I do. It's over there. <laughs> you want me to get it? <laughs> if you want to, you can, or you can just tell us about it. Because <laughs> I don't really know what the name, I don't know who makes it, but um, it's just, it's about this big, it's black and it, it folds and has a magnet. <laughs> We're going to have a little show and tell in a moment here. So I got this, I mean, I, I got it on Amazon. So, um, and I got one for my son because my son was moving into college and I didn't want him to over or undercook things uh, his first year and get sick. So uh, it just, I keep it, um, it's got a magnet. I keep it always handy. If you have something next to your stove, it's perfect. And then um, it just, you press this and it's just like instant. I also have one that's Bluetooth. So you can put it in and on, it has an app on your phone. CDC makes it and you can have it alert you when it reaches the temperature you want. So I do that with my Thanksgiving turkey every year. The cord literally comes out of the oven. It's meant to work that way, but you can have it next to the stove. That's also a great one, affordable. Also, I got that on Amazon, I think as well. So yeah, I'm never without, and also they sell them for like $3 at the grocery store. So even though this was probably less than $15. All right, good luck with your thermometer shopping yes, out there, everybody. <laughs> Ooh, another end of summer, good end of summer beginning yes. of fall question here from Anna. Have you used any pizza ovens? We're looking at getting one for the fall and would love any experience that you've gained, Robin. I have. I actually had one um, and I didn't use it enough. And I felt bad that I didn't use it enough, which is why I, somebody kept looking at it and asking if they could have it, a friend of mine. Um, but I did love it. It was amazing. I didn't utilize it enough. So um, I think they're great for far beyond pizza. You know, I've, I've seen people, you roast vegetables in there. I have, I know people that just dry out their vegetables in there and for storage. Um, but I think they're fantastic. They have come a long way in terms of, um, multi-function so beyond pizza that said i i know a lot of people have turned their grills into pizza ovens so you know they just they they have they, they're using the grill on one side over here they have the certain temperature over here they close the lid they can make a pizza that way and they also have a cooktop so research is probably key there because i think my problem was i really it, i was limited with what i could do with it but if i would have had a grill with with the burners and all that on the side i probably would have been out there more making multiple things um but sure if it's something you want to add to your to your uh your yard <laughs> i mean i think they're great and i have a lot of recipes that are adaptable for pizza ovens. I, we love pizza um homemade crust not homemade crust so we have it all the time and and, and my recipes are definitely suitable for the ovens Great. And anybody watching out there, if you have a pizza oven that you love and want to talk about, yeah. you can drop a comment as well. We would love to crowdsource this one. Yes. Okay. Let's go into zucchini next. Uh, so Robin, another Robin out there is asking, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed with the zucchinis out of my garden. Friends and family don't want them anymore. If I make zucchini lasagna, will it freeze well? And do you have any other suggestions? That's really funny. There's a meme out there though of uh, somebody dropping, running around dropping zucchini off at all these random people's homes. It's really fun. There's so much zucchini. Um, you should look that up. It's funny. Uh, but yes, I, zucchini lasagna would freeze well. I, I also, it's one of my favorite vegetables. Um, so I have a gazillion zucchini recipes on my blog. So robinmillercooks.com. Um, I just posted one a couple, I posted, well, yesterday or the day before was National Zucchini Day, I think the eighth. So I posted a uh, double, double chocolate zucchini bread, garlic Parmesan zucchini, um, all these things that actually would freeze well, especially a, a chocolate zucchini bread, you could make a loaf and you need a lot of zucchini for that bread. You could make a couple loaves and keep them in the freezer 
pull them out when you're ready, thaw them overnight and have chocolate zucchini bread anytime. So that's a great way to use up a lot and keep your um, freezer full of bread, um, sweet and savory zucchini bread. Um, but yes, the lasagna will work. Uh, it may, may or may not have extra liquid when you thaw it, but that's, I mean, that's to be expected and that's fine. So you would just, you know, just maybe use a baster to pull some of that out before serving or not. Um, you know, I, I think it's fine if you're avoiding pasta. I was going to say serve it over pasta, but I'm thinking you're making a zucchini lasagna because you're avoiding pasta. <laughs> um, but yes, and then just definitely check because there's so many different ways. And, and every time I post a zucchini recipe, I get a lot of positive comments and a lot of shares and a lot of feedback because I think um, everyone loves it, but everybody does the same thing with it. So um, I try to think outside the box. I've done pizzas. So maybe we use the pizza oven and the zucchini, but I, <laughs> I've cut it into strips and done sauce, cheese, and pepperoni and made zucchini pizzas. So that's another great way to use a bunch of them in one sitting. Well, we have a couple commenters that are chiming in on some of the things that we've talked about already. So regarding the thermometers that we talked about a little bit, yeah. crowdsourcing is key here. Janine has a shout out for Thermoworks. Love them. There are probe versions and surface tests and check them out. Have you worked with them at all? I know. I can't. No, I haven't. I don't have one. I can picture it, though. Mm -hmm. I don't have one currently. We've got one vote for Thermoworks out there. And then when we go to the pizza ovens, Anya loves my Uni pizza oven. So if you don't know how to spell that and you want to look it up, it's O-O-N-I. Have you used any of those, Robin? Uni, I haven't. Mine was, I haven't used the Uni. I have not. All right. But yeah, that's great to have at least some place to start. Yes, go ahead and Google around. Oh, we've got somebody here with zucchini salsa. So made and canned seven yeah. jars of zucchini salsa. What do you think about that? I love it. And just made me think you could do zucchini pickles too. That would be delicious. Something that's like sweet and like, you know, the the um, the sweet version of them. I think that'd be delicious. I just, oh, yeah, that'd be great. I, because I think zucchini is well sweet and savory. That is what makes it so versatile and so love, lovely. Um, but yeah, that's a great idea. Love the salsa idea. Yeah. Ooh, I really like this next question. This speaking of my New York city apartment days, cooking <laughs> for one, uh, uh -huh. Carla has a question about keeping produce fresh. How do you do this? I've tried putting asparagus in a glass of water, broccoli in an airtight container and salad in a salad stir. I cook for one. So keeping my produce, it's really hard to keep it fresh. Yes, that's true. And I assume I mean, I'll be, I'm sure you're buying the, the smallest quantity that you can, um, you know, a crown of broccoli, obviously asparagus, you have to buy the whole, um, I've never heard of putting asparagus in a glass. Maybe I have. Um, but for me, um, what I have done in the past is when I get home from the grocery store, the first thing I do is I wash all the herbs because they do seem to deteriorate quickly if you keep them in the plastic bag that you bring them home. I give them, I put them separately, you know, so the cilantro goes in the salad spinner. I get it clean and it, I wrap it in paper towel and put that in a plastic bag. I do the same with the parsley. I do the same with the green onions. Um, and then when it comes to broccoli, I can't get to in time or asparagus. I give it a quick blanch, one minute in boiling water that buys me another, another couple of days. So with asparagus, for example, cutting off the woody ends, literally 30 seconds to a minute in uh, boiling water, shock it in cold water after, and that locks in color, flavor, nutrients, and it'll get you an extra couple days out of that asparagus. And then you can proceed as directed with however you were going to cook it um, originally. So that, and I do it with broccoli florets. I've done it with cauliflower, snap peas, green beans, just to get them to last a little bit longer. I tend to, so it's not, my issue isn't the cooking for one. Mine is over purchasing produce because it looks good. So I buy a lot and then I find out everybody has plans and I, <laughs> and I have too much food. I was actually going to follow on with something like that. So if you do find yourself with a refrigerator or a pantry full of produce that you're staring at and you know the time is coming where you're going to lose it all, yeah. what do you suggest? What are some good recipes or ways that you could salvage as much as possible? Well, so the blanching step also means that you can then freeze that vegetable. So you can't just really, they don't freeze well raw. But by, by closing up those capillaries, by locking in the flavor and color, you can go put them in freezer bags or containers and freeze them. 
or what I love to do is a huge stew, um, whether it's meat based or veggie based, um, I'll take all my leftover carrots, um, zucchini, cauliflower, garlic, onion, one big pot of deliciousness. And if I want to add pasta or anything, I would add couscous or quinoa or something to make it a full meal. Um, that's always a great way. Or if you don't add the pasta and you just keep it, you have it, then you have a chunky like primavera sauce. If you add a can of tomatoes pureed or, um, or chopped tomatoes, now you have this beautiful veggie based sauce that you can store in individual containers for six months and have a pasta sauce, a sauce for um, chicken, fish, pork, um, instant sauce that has probably 20 ingredients in it that you don't have to start from scratch. So I loved, I love to do that. I learned that from my mom. She always had um, containers of things labeled from her garden. And then on my Food Network show, I show how to save space in your freezer. You can freeze your sauces flat in plastic bag, in freezer bags, gallon bags. And then once they're solid, you line them up like library books. And it's a real space saver, depending on the kind of freezer you have. I have a drawer, but in that it was a, a side by side and you could line them up. So that's a great way to save all that sauce and save room in your uh, in your freezer and your fridge. Well, I imagine that organization tip would work for people that do the slow cooker freezer yep. bags ingredients. You could freeze them flat and then tip them up once they're yep. frozen and solid. Fantastic. Yep. And you a great way to thaw because I just had this conversation with my boyfriend because he had frozen because he's learning these tricks about saving. Mm -hmm. um, you can pull so a quick thaw um, is to pull that bag directly from the freezer and put it in cold water and it will thaw if you forgot to pull it out overnight which is the best way um, it thaws in an hour you have it in it and you keep changing out the water keep it cool not hot water um, and things cool uh, things thaw quickly that way and safely because they're not um, out of the out of the freezer or fridge for more than an hour before they're thawed and ready to hit the stove Perfect. Oh, these are great tips. Let's keep them coming. We've got a viewer out here that is bored of their weekly rotation and would love, Robin, if you have a quick, easy, healthy dinner recipe that you could recommend for a family of four. Starting with chicken? Starting with anything? Can I, is it, I can go any, do anything? It looks like you've got open-ended, but if you want to put in some more specifics, I'll keep an eye on the yeah. comments out there. I'm going to go by what America seems to want the most, assuming this is somebody who's here, um, chicken, because everybody stares down at that pound of chicken and doesn't know what to do, but it's the most popular protein in the country. So we're all looking for ways to use it. So I'm going to say, regardless of what you have, ch chicken, breast, thighs, tenders, one of my favorite last minute things to do to serve four people that's healthy and easy. Well, I rob the pantry always, um, is I pan sear the chicken and then I either leave it in there and start and dumping in things like canned tomatoes or jarred roasted red peppers, um, a few herbs like oregano and basil, they can be dried, um, simmering that till the chicken's cook, cooked through. And if I've used tomatoes, I splash mozzarella or Parmesan cheese on top and call it a day. If it's roasted red peppers, if I have feta, I'll throw, you know, more of a salty cheese on top. And that way you've got your protein, a couple of vegetables, herbs, and dairy. So all you really need is if you want a hunk of bread on the side, or, um, I mean, you wouldn't even need a salad, you could. Um, if you are not opposed to carbohydrates, then a bowl of rice or some pasta or um, a, a nice crusty bread. And then you've got a full meal in one skillet. I have them weekly on my blog because I do that all the time. That's what my favorite thing to do is cook in the skillet, bring the skillet to the table. I have one pan to clean and all the flavors have evolved because they spent the entire time together in the pan. Whoa, fantastic. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> that will be a new suggestion for you to try. Uh, if anybody else has suggestions that you love and want to drop into the chat box, please let's crowdsource this one as well. Uh, yes, because there's always the sheet pan meals. There's always, always. those. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, Amy has a suggestion uh, going into the produce that we were just talking about. Uh, besides the stew, Robin, that you said, uh, can you can produce and vegetables and things? What would you say to that? I would say yes. And uh, 
doing do it wisely because we know that there can be some bacteria if you if it's not done precisely i wrote an article on canning um and i was very careful i was very specific about things that could go wrong because if you get any bacteria in there you don't know it um and then you open it up and and you know there's risk uh, granted, I was doing, I, I think my example were pickles, which means you were going to eat them uncooked. So if you're doing a vegetable that you're going to reheat, that's a different story. But yes, that's an excellent idea. And I assume you're meaning, you know, the jars, but there is a whole process. Um, and I suggest watching some YouTube videos on how to, you know, do clean the jars, make sure they're sanitized, make sure they're sealed. And then that's an excellent way. And they will have to be, the vegetables will have to be in some sort of liquid. You don't just... So they have to be, you know, canning is the, it's the heat from the liquid that creates the suction that keeps them shelf stable. So um, I would Google some recipes for canning things like zucchini and tomatoes so that you make sure you have enough liquid to create that seal. Okay, while we're talking about ideas, a uh, couple comments came in right one after the other. This is great. We're going to go with Valerie's first. Uh, Valerie likes to add shrimp to leftover vegetables and then add nice. ramen noodles. Do you have nice. tips or tricks for that that you'd like to I share? Love it. Yeah, I love, I, I love doing that too. And I've done that recently too. It's a great way to stretch, you know, what is it, 15 cents for a bag of ramen and you just, now you just serve two or three extra people. Um, I throw away the seasoning packet because all the flavors are, I think that's a fantastic idea. You could do it with shrimp, tofu, chicken, leftover steak. The cookbook I'm writing now, half of the book is using leftovers. So the first half is all the recipes for your proteins and starches. And the second half is what do you do with all the leftover of that? So um, I, this is a great way to stretch, whether it's a leftover or whether it's your vegetables is to take those noodles because they really are wholesome um, and not and not high in salt when you throw away the seasoning packet. So that's a fantastic idea. And um, if you're not doing the instant ramen, the Asian noodle section now is huge. So anything from somen, uh, soba, uh, the Chinese stir fry noodles. I love the rice noodles, the pad thai noodles. Um, super healthy and a great way to, uh, to bulk up a meal affordably. Perfect. And Kathy is asking, uh, back to the zucchini, what do you have to say about zucchini pesto? Oh, that's a great idea. I love pesto and I love creative pesto. So I've done a pars parsley walnut because I was like, why should basil and pine nuts have all the fun? So I've done cashew and cilantro. So there's, I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm wondering if you would puree it in there with the basil, pine nuts and parm, or if it would be its own. I think that would be an excellent idea. And I know that zucchini partners incredibly well with garlic and Parmesan. So we know that that would, it could be a fantastic base. Just, uh, my suggestion would be obviously have it lengthwise and scoop out the seeds mm -hmm. and proceed from there. I'm sure there are recipes out there for it though. And if not, I'm going to write one because that's a great idea and I'll credit you. <laughs> yes. Perfect. All right. Happy. You're killing it out there. Ooh, we have a beginner question next. This one comes from Carla. Uh, is there an easy chart that I can put on my fridge for when meats go bad? I feel like I'm calling my mom every other day to ask her if my chicken is still good to eat. Oh. Oh, that's so funny. Um, I think the, I, <laughs> and my boyfriend calls me every day too. And, and he's like, I pulled this out two days ago and now I did it. Um, I think it's funny. And, and I, I always hope I'm right because I don't know when he, so my first thing is um, I'm assuming you label and date everything. Cause that, I know it seems tedious, but it really is helpful when I forget. And I see something that I don't recognize in the freezer. I have no idea what it is when I put it in there. Um, so label and dating, with um, just a piece of tape and a Sharpie is a great way to know. Um, fr frozen foods typically are good for up to six months, thaw them overnight, eat them within three days. Regarding a chart, um, I bet you the USDA has one or eatright.org, you know, the American Dietetic Association probably has one. Otherwise you'd have to go individually to like the American Poultry and the Beef Council and it. So, but I would say that those would be my, my go-tos but in general, um, you know, three days really in your fridge, I think, uh, is when you should start rethinking. Um, even, so if it's, you've pulled it from the freezer 24 hours later, start that three day clock. It's thawed now, um, for anything, for any, any protein. Um, that's, that's, but, but in terms of a chart, that's what I would suggest USDA or eatright.org. Uh, hopefully they have it. Um, and that way you're safe and then you can put it on your 
fridge. Or save it on your phone, perhaps. Maybe just oh yeah, yeah, yeah. save it on your phone. phone. Yeah, but but starting by label and labeling and dating everything is really your first line of defense, and then you know. When in doubt, throw it out is what I used to say, but I like. I don't like throwing things out. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Carla, you're not alone. I used to call my mom every day too. Yeah. When I was brand new to cooking for myself. <laughs> Ooh, Elizabeth has a question here. Her son has given up eating meat. Can you come up with some more meatless recipes to suggest or any vegetarian cookbooks that you'd like to talk about? Um, there are so many wonderful ways to get protein now. Uh, but uh, so we mean, I'm wondering if he's still eating eggs and cheese because if he is, that's, you know, that's completely fine. I don't know how old he is, but p kids need protein. We all do, but kids definitely do. Um, so in terms of ve vegetarian cookbooks, I don't know off the top of my head. I have a whole vegetarian section on my blog, um, but I, I know that there are incredible ways to get meat. So if he's, if he's eating eggs, fantastic. You don't have to eat steak ever again because eggs are the perfect protein. They have everything you need in all the right um, amounts. Uh, cheese is great. Yogurt's great. Easy to digest. Better, you know, better than a glass of milk because it's easy to digest and um, and a great source of protein. And there are plenty of lean options out there. Um, let's just say he's going vegan. Um, nuts, great way to get protein in the diet. Almonds walnuts, pecans, cashews, pistachios, peanuts, if he can have them. So those are great ways to get the protein he needs for growing, for sleeping, for brain function, to partner with all the complex carbs. And a lot of people will give up meat. Um, you know, it's, it's, they, they think it's just going to be a pasta rice diet. It doesn't have to be. It should be a very colorful diet. The most nutritious foods are the most colorful foods. So dark greens, bright orange carrots, red bell peppers. Um, if, so if you look at the produce section and you say, well, that's really colorful, that's probably nutritious, it's true. Um, beets, things like that. Um, loading up with that, big hearty medleys of all those things. And there's so many different grains to choose from now. Quinoa is almost a perfect protein, excellent. Um, there's rice medleys out there now that have brown, white, red, basmati, wild, all in one bowl. So um, check out the grain aisle too and um, and try to stick with whole grains that offer some fiber and some nutrients versus minute rice and, and white pastas. And I, he'll be fine. I mean, that, that's there's a, plenty of cultures that have people living into their hundreds that are all plant-based. Now, I wonder if you'll talk a little bit, Robin, about, I know that we had the Impossible Burger and Beyond Burgers, but now it's a little more common that you can just find them as meat. Have you worked with them as a protein before? What do you have? I, to yes, that? I, I have. I've always been, and maybe maybe it's just because I cook for a living, but I always prefer to start from scratch rather than a burger that has a bunch of different ingredients in it mm -hmm. um, or a meat substitute with a bunch of different ingredients in it. Same thing with the whole gluten-free trend. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather eat something that I've made that doesn't have gluten in it than some of these snack foods that are bad for you. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I'd rather just have a whole bunch of whole foods than a processed food. And it'll be much more nutritious. I know where it came from and it'll be full of all the nutrients I need and fiber and no additives, colors, chemicals, um, preservatives, hormones. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I hope that is helpful. Uh, it's definitely, again, crowdsource in the comments. If anybody yes. has meatless recipes that you love, feel free to share. Uh, I'm going to go back to the summer squash. So maybe not just zucchini. Uh, Linda looks like she's curious about all the summer squashes. What do you do with the larger summer squash? Uh, my friend's kids call them the sneaky squashes because they don't catch them early enough and they have to pick. Oh, <laughs> You do the same thing with them that you do all the others. You just serve more people <laughs> <laughs> and store more. Uh, yeah, I know. Those are, you know, you hate to throw them out because they're, but, you know, if you try to find a way to use them. But I think some of the ideas that we have today in terms of um, turning them into sauces and the pesto, that pesto recipe could be a big batch of pesto, zucchini pesto or squash pesto could be frozen 
that would freeze very well, as would all the chunky sauces and stews. Um, you could, uh, the way that I, I told you about uh, making the pizza, so sliced zucchini, one of those, those larger squashes would make great bases for zucchini, I mean for pizza. So you top it with sauce and cheese and whatever other toppings and bake it just like you would a pizza. Those would be great because they're bigger. Um, you could do somebody who's going to make a zucchini lasagna. In the very beginning, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a great way to use that. And nice long strips. And um, think of it as anything that you would use a lasagna noodle for. You could do, you could do with with a uh, big squash. All right. Now we're going to run through the day a little bit with these next two questions. We're going to start with lunch. So Kelsey asks, Robin, do you have any ideas for a quick lunch at home? Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> let's see because i mean there are so many different uh um ideas it depens what i mean if you have leftover my first thing is do i have leftover chicken from the night before or do i have leftover shrimp from the night before can i turn that into a salad and put it in a melon you know that's the kind of thing it's like then i'm getting fruit my bowl is the fruit and then i have just a quick toss of leftover chicken some salad dressing maybe some grapes or an apple or something just to turn that into a, a whole meal Lettuce wraps are great. If you have lettuce, butter, uh, butter also called bib lettuce, is great for just throwing you know, tuna, tomatoes, onion, capers, maybe a drizzle of, of salad dressing, and you can roll that up, eat it with one hand. I, I love wraps. The uh, flatbreads are great. The whole grain, there's so many different tortillas out there now. There's whole grain, there's spinach, there's sun-dried tomato, there's low carb, there's high carb, there's keto, there's everything. Um, just loading that up with whatever you want, almost like you're making a uh, sushi roll and rolling it up tightly. I love doing wraps in a pinch. Um, and then if you have all that out, you could make two. And then tomorrow you don't have that question because you already have one. Um, so those, those are some of my go-tos, using what you already have, not having to cook too much um, or starting with something. So my mom turned me onto this when I was single in New York and, and wanting quick meals like that. She starts with a can of soup and then she builds on it. So, for example, like a Progresso minestrone, right? You don't cook it. She would just start making a big salad out of that. So, and then putting it over lettuce, which is actually a fantastic way to take a can of soup and add some cooked chicken or shrimp or whatever, put it over greens, and you have all those vegetables. And in minestrone, you have beans. A hearty meal with, um, completely not using the soup as it's intended. So that's like a, just a fun way and you know, keeping your pantry stocked with stuff like that, it'll, it'll always be set. Mm -hmm. And very quick as well. Don't even have yeah. to turn on the stove top. Yeah. All right, let's move to dinner next. And this is a nice broad question. So <laughs> here you go, Robin. Okay. To know is it from Kelsey again? <laughs> <laughs> Beth this time. And Beth wants to know what your favorite dish is to make for dinner. This is Beth. Beth wants to know. Yes. So it's funny. I kind of have a standard answer because um, I never like to make the same thing twice. And everyone knows that. And that's why I'm on my 11th cookbook and why I blog every day, because I refuse to make the same thing twice. I might make something that similar. And so those, my favorite thing for me to eat that I would make for myself every day if it didn't bore everyone is my vegetarian noodles. I love the rice noodles with all the vegetables I have. And I make this quick stir fry sauce with apricot preserves and soy and, and um, sesame and mirin, like seven ingredients in the whole thing. And then I add peppers and onions, whatever. I, that's my favorite thing. It's a, my twist on pad thai um, because sometimes I'll add peanut butter or peanuts to it. Um, but I really try not to cook the same thing twice. So if I have had an Italian meal on Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm going to want to do something that's Mexican or Tex-Mex or Greek, um, something that's not in that realm. And then I might want to go American or then I might want to go French. So I try to vary the flavor so we never get bored and we stay kind of excited for mealtime. So um, that's really the truth. <laughs> but they say most people cook the same 10 dishes, which is fine. And that's the same 10. They know what they're doing. It gets to the table mindlessly. And it's usually great, healthy, wholesome. Um, but sometimes it's fun to just do something a little bit different when you have the extra time. Ooh, our next one, this is a fantastic username. Too Many Strings is out there. Too Many Strings, <laughs> Too Many Strings asks, what can I use to substitute for nuts? Like nuts in a crust or in a sweet bread? 
Excellent question. Uh, well, I usually tell people just leave them out. You're not going to be missing anything. Um, you, if, if you're saying it's in a crust, um, and I'm assuming there may be an allergy there, um, usually you can just leave them out and and not the ratio isn't messed up. Because I have done, I have a pie recipe that there's a hazelnut crust and you can just leave the hazelnuts out. They just add a flavor. They don't help hold the crust together or in any way. They add texture and flavor. Um, and when it comes to breads, again, you can just leave them out. Um, substitute in chocolate chips because, you, you know, I think that's a great, it depends on the bread, obviously. But if you're thinking of something that's like a banana nut bread, chocolate chips would work great in there and everyone loves that. So I think that, or banana chips, um, coconut, those are things that you can that give you the nuttiness and give you the, the um, different texture without adding nuts. But if there's something specific, then I can certainly answer that too, if you want to. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for any clarification. Yeah. Hopefully that was a helpful starting point. Uh, I do want to let our viewers know we have a little under 10 minutes, so we will have time for a few more questions. If you've been hanging on to one and you haven't put it <laughs> in the chat box yet, now is your chance to give it a try. We'll get to as many as we can before we have to say goodbye. Uh, the time has really flown. <laughs> I know. I was like, what? <laughs> So we'll, go, here. we'll go to Kathy's question next. Uh, do you do anything like a make ahead freezer meal for later on in the fall? I always, like I only do that. <laughs> 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 so if I have all my stuff out and that's one of the great things about, and I think, I don't know, out of my 10 cookbooks that I currently have, I think six or seven of them do that. So here, you know, if you're going to go to all this trouble to make this dish, make two and have one in the freezer um, or save half and have it for three months later in the fall. So yes, especially now when everybody's got all this zucchini, make something for your future self three months from now, whether it's a main dish or a side dish um, and get a really good airtight container or a, um, a casserole dish, seal it with plastic and then foil label and date it. Um, and it's good for three months. But yes, use that summer produce now so you can enjoy those fresh tomatoes and fresh squash um, and those wonderful, you know, fresh basil, all those wonderful flavors that we are enjoying now. And you might really be craving them, you know, mid-November. Mm -hmm. And then this is probably something that would apply. I know a lot of people are renovating their kitchens. Uh, oh. That has been a big thing. And I would assume that would be a fantastic way to make the most of not having access Yes. to a stove top, correct? Yes. And so, yes. Um, and one well, of the other things that I do in, in this current book and a lot of my recipes is let's just say I'm going to throw four chicken breasts on a sheet pan um, to make dinner tonight. I'm going to throw two extra or three or four extra. Now I have four extra chicken breasts for a future meal. So, um, you know, for that lunch, that last minute lunch that we wanted to make, Kathy, maybe somebody wanted to make last minute lunch. Now you have that cooked chicken and all you did was just take up more space on your sheet pan. So if you don't have the cooktop and you're taking advantage of the oven and sheet pan meals, why not load it up, roast some extra vegetables, roast some extra protein and, and have it for a future meal, whether you reheat it or not, it's cooked, it's ready to go. And you could just toss together a salad if you can't have, if you don't have access to your kitchen. And there's been so many times when I haven't, whether it's been something wasn't working, I have a glass cooktop, I dropped a cast iron pan on it and I shattered it. Um, so I was without that for a little while. So I got creative with the oven. I got creative with um, no cook meals. So there's always a way. And, and as you know, Leah, there's little tiny apartments. I had one burner in my apartment when I when I said I wrote my first cookbook. I had one burner. So I had to get creative with what I was making and what could I add to it that didn't need to be cooked. What could go along the side? So um, yeah, but there's a new kitchen coming, right? So there's, it's always exciting knowing it's temporary. Indeed. Oh, all right. I think we have time for two more questions. I might try to slide a third one in, but let's <laughs> I'll be quick with my answers. We'll go to Wendy's next. Uh, Wendy asks, how do you feel about collagen powders? I know East Asian food has a lot of good collagen is in it. Do you know what that is in the broths and things? Yes. So collagen um, has become uh, the craze lately, but it's something that Asian cultures, for example, have been doing for thousands of years. So um, collagen is found in the bones of animals and it supports our, our healthy bone, teeth, nails, hair system. Um, and so 
the trend is to add the powders to everything. Um, however, for example, in China, I have a friend born and raised in Beijing every morning on the way to school, she stopped at a little cart and got a, a thing, a bowl of bone broth, which was naturally just collagen rich because it was just boiled bones uh, and vegetables. So she was getting the collagen naturally that way every day. Um, and it was delicious. So she wasn't doing it for that reason, but the payoff, the benefit was that she was getting collagen that way. So should you buy the powders? That's really a personal choice. I have, I've done it. I have some packets in my cabinet because I just tried it for a little while to see if my you know, hair, nail, see if I saw a difference. Um, or you could just start buying or make your own the, the uh, bone broths because you can find them right next to all the regular chicken and beef broths at the regular grocery store. I see them everywhere now. Um, and those are collagen rich. I would turn it over, read the ingredient list to make sure they really are. And I'm just not using the name to get you to buy it. Um, or you can make your own. And I grew up, my mom always just threw all the bones that were left over in a pot and made, it was sometimes it would be lamb and beef in the same pot or, you know, whatever bones she had left, she made these big rich stocks and stored them in the freezer. So you could make your own as well and, um, and get the collagen that way naturally. So there are many different ways to, to get there, but I do know that it is a trend um, that's been around for a while. So, but it's been thousands of years in the making. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I think this next question is a really good one to end on. Uh, it comes from Diane and Diane is curious, Robin, if you have a favorite cookbook that you have written. The one I'm writing now comes out in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my favorite one is quick fix meals because um, each chapter has one recipe that spins off into two more. And one of them is even like a sauce that spins into two more dishes using that sauce in a creative way. So it's called Quick Fix Meals. It's the name of my show on Food Network, Quick Fix Meals. So you probably remember that. Um, I just loved, it was really in-depth, really fun, easy to follow, pictures, colorful. I, that, that's And so that's what I'm kind of doing with this one too. It's going to be very similar to that one with all new recipes. All right. Well, fantastic. That leads me into the very last thing. I would love to give you the floor, Robin, and tell us again for anybody that wasn't with us at the top of the hour, where they can find you, um, any final thoughts you want to leave us with or anything you want viewers to keep an eye out for in the future. So go ahead and give us some final thoughts. All right. Thanks, Leah. And thanks everyone for coming. This was super fun. I love this. I wish I could do this every day because I love answering questions. I love connecting. So this was great. Let's do it again. Um, in the meantime, if you need me, my website is Robin Miller Cooks. I have a, a pop-up. You can ask me questions. I have a contact sheet. You can ask me questions there. You can find my recipes. You can find links to what I'm up to. So my show on discovery, my shows on Craftsy. I have a column um, on Mashed. I have a column in the Republic and USA Today Food. And I'm writing Cookbook 11 so that I'll let you know. For sure, you'll know when that comes out. I'm on all the social channels every day, multiple times. You'll have links to that. So the one-stop shop is robinmillercooks.com. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out because that's why I do what I do is to connect with people and help them create healthy, delicious weeknight meals and snacks and breakfasts and, and, and do it while they're having fun um, and not stressing about it. So I'm there. If you have more questions, please don't hesitate. All right. Well, with that said, first I have to say thank you, Robin, for joining us today. This was fantastic. We had lots of great yes. questions. Uh, the chat box is still available. If anybody wants to look through, we did have some crowdsourcing, some fantastic suggestions from other viewers as well. And uh, as always, we would love to see all of you viewers back for another Craftsy Chats in the future. So keep your eyes on the schedule. Uh, on behalf of Robin and the entire team, it is my job to say thank you for joining us for today's Craftsy Chats. Have a a lot of fun with your crafting, cooking, baking in the meantime, and we will see you for the next one. Take care.